In this video, we are interviewing a veteran boiler contractor on the East Coast. We talk about everything from cast iron radiators to cast iron boilers, high efficiency systems, as well as some of the other considerations that go into picking out the best HVAC system for your home when you are in the market for system replacement if you happen to have a boiler. So if you're in the market for HVAC system replacement and you have a boiler and you have some questions in this video, we will answer as much of those as we possibly can. And in addition to that, at the end of this video, we'll make sure to link the long form version of this interview because this is actually just a short excerpt of a longer form interview so if you're curious and want to check out the full length interview we'll make sure to link that at the end for your convenience enjoy and then also just kind of uh switching gears here we've talked a lot about obviously heat pumps forced air systems but you guys also do, uh, do a lot of boiler work is that correct oh yeah love boilers Awesome. And so for people that are watching this, um, I guess what I, you know, one of the things we get calls about, and I don't know if you guys get this out there a lot is people that are interested in either adding like radiant floors, if they already have an existing boiler. Um, and people are asking obviously about high efficiency versus cast iron. Um, me personally, I like cast iron. They're, they're reliable. They're obviously not nearly as efficient. So depending on, you know, the home and the, uh, the envelope, um, natural draft. It's just, you know, we don't, we don't have problems with them. Um, we're dealing with different, uh, you know, there's, there's obviously a lot of design considerations. We still put, you know, I have a high efficiency at my, or I have two high efficiencies at my house. Cause we have a, we have a snow melt and we also have a, a combi boiler. So I don't have a cast iron. Um, but that being said, uh, you know, I, I know you guys run into a lot of different stuff out there. What are some of the, the customer requests that you're getting? What are the systems that you're seeing installed? And then what are some of the issues that you're, you're seeing installed? I know that's like a big question to unpack or a lot of different <laughs> things, but I just figured I'd put it all out there and let you kind of run with it. Yeah, no, that's okay. That's okay. So we live in an area um, where boilers uh, at one point was the main heating system that was here. Now, with the way that home building has gone, and particularly in this region, you know, builders are wanting to do things at a more cost-effective pace. That's contractor term for cheap. Um, sure. and, so, <laughs> and so they, uh, what they've done, they've gone to, you know, central duct systems with forced air where you can move air as opposed to having um, hot water piping running throughout the house, which typically is going to be in today's world, copper, which is very, very expensive. Um, I think that we I'm kind of disappointed because hydronic heat is so even and so much more comfortable. You're not moving air, uh, so you're not drying out the air. It's pretty consistent on all levels. Like you don't have the discrepancy of it's so much warmer upstairs versus downstairs. Generally, wherever you've got the hot water running through the through the radiators, you're going to be warm. Um, but what we come across in our region for those that do have boilers, we find a lot of 50 and 60 year old boilers that are still rocking and rolling, doing their thing. They're turning on, they're turning off, they're heating the home, but are they safe? And that's where we can go in, do a combustion analysis. We can discern, you know, is this thing really operating at peak safety? It's obviously turning on. Older ones are not that efficient, but there's not huge gains in efficiency with the old atmospherically vented uh, boilers anyway. Um, but, you know, is it going to need a super big cleaning where you have to de-jacket the thing, get in there with the big brushes and, and get everything cleaned out? That could be a very expensive situation. Cool thing is there's a lot of newer boiler setups where people can save space. We can do high efficiency condensing boilers. Bosch makes a great one. Uh, Wild McLean makes a great one. You can mount it on the wall. Um, Navian's another one. You can mount it on the wall, save a tremendous amount of space on your flooring, uh, and the repiping is not too much of an overhaul. Um, we're going to find a lot of cast iron in our region, though, because it is older boiler systems. So you're rarely going to find copper throughout. Um, the other thing that we find a lot of are the vertical radiators, uh, the very, very old, very beautiful, the ornate ones that were, you know, hand laid where they have all the neat design in them and everything. People want to keep those. They want to keep that beautiful old feel, especially in D.C. Um, and so there's actually a market for resale on those old stand up cast iron radiators, which is pretty neat. There's companies out there that will clean them out real good, uh, ensure their quality, make sure that they're going to last another hundred years. Um, so yeah, so that's, those, those are the things that we come across with, with boilers. Right on. And those radiators, they're running at a higher, uh, temp, right? Same as baseboard heat, like 180 degrees is what you Correct. run through. The okay. And then are you running, um, in those systems though, I mean, you run high efficiency, you can run a high efficiency through a radiator system, right? It's just about getting the venting out. Is that the issue? You're Correct. Running? Yeah. Yeah. That's when you're going to change from an atmospherically vented, just using gravity and heat to carry the, uh, post combustion flue gas out of the house. You're going to direct vent it. So you're going to use schedule 40 PVC. You're going to run an intake pipe outside. You're going to run an exhaust pipe outside. Um, that does a couple of things. One, it's going to improve the overall efficiency of the system. 
It also gives it the ability to have a modulating setup where you can run at lower BTUs and lower temperatures um, to achieve the same purpose. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and uh, the condensation as well, it's going to capture that condensation and, and grab that extra heat, increasing the efficiency. The other benefit is that it improves building performance. So now that you're not burning oxygen from inside the house, you're not putting the house into a, potentially putting the house into a negative pressure, bringing in, you know, outside air drafting or anything like that, because you're actually using outside air for combustion. So, yeah. Yeah. And the direct vented appliances too, they're nice because a lot of times you're able to cap off the combustion air, right? Because are do you guys put in a lot of combi boilers or do you do a high efficiency with a sidearm or do you have a preference? Yeah, we'll do, we'll do a few combis. Um, and then sometimes we'll have, you know, the standing storage tank that we'll pipe over to it to, to help heat that up and, and give the client, um, you know, at least a tank. So that way, if, uh, <laughs> if the boiler was ever to have an issue or power was to go out to where it couldn't run, you've at least got to storage tank with with you know 50 or 75 gallons sitting there um combis i think are still uh new to the market new enough that while we are installing them not nearly to the amount or volume of the the standard boilers or the high efficiency boilers right on and um as far as uh because obviously you see a lot of installs out there and you guys do you know service and um new installations and you're doing mostly retrofit right no new construction yeah we try to avoid new construction we'll work with a with um a few private builders because those are always fun jobs to do they provide like a, custom a homes and, yeah custom home setups yeah. Nice. They, yeah they provide unique challenges that are always fun it just keeps your brain intrigued with what we're doing but we try to avoid it more so over because it can become a bit tedious and you know, longer stretches of time to accomplish something. So retrofit is our target. And and uh, we have a lot of fun with that too. You know, I look at retrofit as cleaning up other people's messes. <laughs> I'm sure oh, you've right. come across plenty of systems you've seen installed where you're like, what did they do? And then you get to go in there and, you know, do it the right way, clean it up, prove with science and data that we're actually, you know, pr producing the CFMs and the BTUs that's required for this home and for that client you know, really meeting their needs and, and increasing their efficiency overall. Yeah, absolutely. What are you uh, running into in terms of problems? Like, what do you see some of the biggest mistakes made on some of the installs that you guys are cleaning up? Is it like, you know, like pipe wrong or what, what are you guys running into? You know, when it comes to HVAC, um, a lot of the retrofits that we're doing are from the time of new construction. And so you're, mm -hmm. you can see that clearly it was all about the speed of how many jobs can you get done in a day? So it's really cleaning everything up. I mean, the way that the ductwork is actually connected to the evaporator coil or the furnace or the air handler, um, the sizing of the ductwork, we've seen instances where I guess the installing subcontractor flip-flopped the return in the supply ducting. So you've got really small returns in these oversized supplies that oh, wow. really don't create a good balance for the system. So we've seen everything. I mean, from kinks in, in copper line sets that were hidden way up in the ceiling you know, behind the insulation or the uh, rubber techs, um, gaps in the ductwork connections to the actual equipment itself, things not being sealed up. So you've got a lot of air that's leaking out all over the place. Um, flu piping that actually somehow passed inspection, but is undersized. So, I mean, we've seen all types of stuff out there. And and that's where we, we actually have a lot of fun because cleaning up those messes and, and getting it to where it's precise in the way it should be. That's a good feeling. That's a very good feeling. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, and I think that your techs learn a lot about HVAC by doing it too, because when you see why something's not working, it just it and you have to and you have to spend, you know, an eight hour day at the same job fixing it to make sure someone has heat. And it was because it was like a systemic problem and you you fixed it. You learn like, oh, the importance of airflow, you know, in yes. one lesson. So that's great. Um, yeah, one of the things that we've have learned over the years that I especially have learned over the years, um, is that most of the service calls that we end up running. Running. Most of the fail points are all install derived. Um, and it's not like it's a thing where the installation happened and within a, a month or three months or six months, we're having this problem. I mean, these are like long term effects that create problems that, that show themselves down the line. You know, so, for example, airflow, it, there's a chance that it may not immediately show that problem, but then let the temperature get up past 100 degrees and all of a sudden you can't keep up. And it's not because of the system, it's because of the ductwork. You know, so there's like we find that, again, systemic issues that present themselves, you know, three, four or five years down the line. So, yeah. Right on. And also um, just switching gears, because I understand you have some experience about geothermal. So I'd like to, you know, ask you some questions and pick your brain because a lot of, uh, we do get a lot of interest in geothermal. Um, you know, I have my opinions, which I'll, I'll share later because I want to hear yours first. 
but <laughs> you're um when you're talking to people about geothermal and comparing let's say a geothermal let's say they're putting in a new system and they want it and they are like hey we're considering geothermal or high efficiency heat pump and furnace combo um you know or maybe they have uh you know radiant in-floor heating and so that's why they're considering geothermal what are um, I guess, what are the considerations and how do you compare those two? And what are kind of your, any thoughts you want to share on geothermal and how it works? Yeah. I mean, you know, look, the, the idea of geothermal and, and how it works, the principles of it is, is really smart. It's a, it's a good thing. Uh, I think the biggest detractor with geothermal is the initial investment cost. There's a lot of bad information out on the internet that has people thinking that it should cost $1 amount where really the fixed cost is going to be significantly higher. I've seen estimates online of 30 to 40 or $50,000 initial investment cost, And that's generally not the case. I mean, generally speaking, 30 to $40,000 is what it's going to cost to drill the hole to run your piping for the actual loop that goes into the earth. And then you've got the bring the loop in, you've got the equipment after that. So really, I mean, when I'm talking to my clients about geothermal systems, I try to really understand what their goal is. You know, do you want efficient cheap heating and cooling is that the target do you want to reduce your carbon footprint is that the target how long are you planning on being in the house you know for those who are going to only be in their house for 10 years the investment cost is not worth it you're not going to get that money back um and i don't see where it's going to add any value to the home either um not to mention not every home needs geothermal you know i i believe that the, the structures, the physical structures that actually are more so the ones that need geothermal are the ones that are massive structures with a tremendous amount of cubic volume, right? We're not heating and cooling the floor. So square footage is, is this much. It's the cubic volume. You know, you could have a 5,000 square foot house with 12 foot ceilings, and it's a lot more cubic volume than if it had eight foot ceilings. So, you know, larger cubic volume, that's where geo can be a good thing, but also longevity in the house. You know, it's still a heat pump system. So it's still going to have fail time and it's still going to have a lifespan. And, you know, if, if at 15 to 18 years in that heat pump fails, you, you got to replace it. And that just kicks the return of investment can further down the line. So, you know, I'm a fan of the idea of geo. I think that if its cost was more effective for the general public, it'd be a smarter idea, but you can actually achieve a lot of that efficiency by going with a dual fuel inverter driven system or an inverter driven heat pump system. Um, I can give you a quick example. I had a, a client uh, who was an economist uh, for the federal government. So numbers, that's what he does. He calculates things all day long. And he wanted to go geo. He had a 10,000 square foot house, pretty much an average of 10 foot ceilings throughout. Um, and he really, really wanted to go geo. So we sat down and we crunched the numbers. We talked about the investment cost of geo, drilling the hole, running the, the piping, getting the new equipment set, all the electrical runs, everything that's required. Uh, and the investment on that was going to be around seventy-five to eighty-two thousand dollars, based on what the drilling company was going to tell us once they started actually putting the hole in the earth. We did the analytics on that, on what the cost benefit would be for him, because he was on propane a lot, like I am here at my house. And then we ran the numbers on actually doing a conversion to a dual fuel setup. We took his furnaces from eighty percent to ninety-seven percent. We used American standard modulating gas furnaces. We did 20 sear heat pump systems with that. We converted his water heater to a tankless, which was 96% efficient as well. And when we ran the numbers on that, it looked like we were gonna actually achieve a return on that investment at year 11.8. So almost 12 years in on the new equipment, the savings from the reduction of propane consumption was gonna pay off the equipment. His all in investment cost on that job was gonna be around $45,000. So almost about half, roughly 40% less, 45% less than the geo investment. I got to speak with that client about uh, a year and a half, two years later, and we reduced his propane consumption by 93%. That wow. brought his return on investment up from 11.8 to year 7.9. And so um, within the warranty period of 10 years, he was able to pay off the equipment from the savings of the propane. So listen, if it's all about efficiency, we can do it another way and you don't have to spend all the geo money. It's definitely more of an off-grid product, you would say, just because yeah. that's where the, the cost for heating is more expensive because you're dealing with oil and uh, propane at that point. So that, yeah, improves that break even. No, I'm I'm kind of in the same in the same boat. I know right now there's a 30% tax credit on geothermal, um, and so that does bring it down. But that's still if you're talking 80 versus or, you know versus 45, that's still you know an extra 10, 15 grand. So it does it does 
make a difference. But um, yeah, I've, you know, for people, viewers that are watching, I think this is my opinion. I'm curious if, if you agree or disagree, but um, I think like they make a lot of sense in places like Canada or places where it's like, cause you're getting like negative 20, negative 30, yeah. where just most like air source heat pumps, the COP drops at, at those temps. Whereas, you know, geothermal, you're still going to have a COP of like four and a half, five, six, um, even with those super cold outside temps. And so that's where it makes sense, especially if you're off grid, cause then you're propane. And so, I mean, I think in those environments, it, it, it makes sense, but yeah, even then though, there you could, well, I guess no. Yeah. Cause you, you really can't run a heat pump when it's that cold out. You could, you could do dual fuel for sure. You can do dual fuel and you, you would work to a degree, right? Because there are cold yeah. climate heat pumps that exist that can operate at yeah. negative 15 degrees, but even with that, it might still be you know, a little bit drafty. Um, so yeah, I mean, to your point, those colder temperatures really could, could, um, benefit from having that kind of a setup. Our market, we just don't get that cold. I mean, we For really sure. just not, our average hover temp where it just generally kind of hovers over the winter season is mid to upper 20s. It's not it's not like super, super cold. It's tolerable. Cold climate heat pumps work really, really well. Inverter driven heat pumps work really, really well in our market. So it's just there's no need for all that uh, additional investment costs. Yeah, no, that's kind of what I thought. And it, it's funny because sometimes when I put, we'll put out a, a video that's about like, you know, cold, cli you know, heat pumps working in cold climates and like, you know, that's a myth, blah, blah, blah. And I'll always get someone in the, in the comments. So it's like, it's negative 50 at my house. I'm like, listen, if your neighbor's Santa, okay, it might not work. I'm not, gonna, <laughs> but yeah, you're, you're okay. Yeah. You're, you're, you're probably going to be making a fire at that point and <laughs> running your furnace. Like, yeah. So, you know, but for everyone else who doesn't live in the North Pole, um, they, they work. So, uh, but people love to bust your chops. That's the comment section on YouTube for you. So hopefully you found that content helpful. And if you did, please smash that like button for the algorithm and consider subscribing to the channel if you found this content helpful. It's a free way that you can show your support and it is much appreciated. And if you're interested in connecting with Dario, there'll be a link to his information in the description on how you can get in touch with IAQ Medics or Bondsby if you happen to be in the DMV area. And if you're outside that area and you you'd like to be connected with a contractor in your area. That's why we created the HVACdopeShow.com. This is a referral service. There's absolutely no charge to you, but if you submit your information and request a contractor, we will work to handpick a contractor in your area. This is in a soft launch mode currently as of the filming of this video. And so if we don't get back to you right away with a contractor, that's just because we don't have an immediate referral in your area. So we hope you found this content helpful and we look forward to catching you on the next episode.